hurt, it will cause a problem, uh, but I do need a volunteer if you would. Just any money would be fine. Thank you, Ron. Come on up. <laughs> okay, so, so here's how this works. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to ask you, and I appreciate it if you would follow along. Uh, if you would, uh, in a second, if you would close your eyes, I'm going to hold something in front of you, and you're going to reach in with one hand, and you are going to feel around and figure out what it is. And you're going to tell us what you think it is. Sound good? Okay. Um, keep your eyes closed as you feel around, because it may take a couple of guesses to figure out what it is. Sound good? Okay. Hang on. I got to I gotta pull it out. Right. So, just go ahead and reach your hand inside the bag. Just feel around. What is that? What do you think? Uh, 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 yeah. Any guesses? What does it feel like? It's something like a bit. Kind of like a bit. Okay. okay. And one more guess? You want to try one more guess? Um, a scarf. A scarf? All right, you can open your eyes. What is that? <laughs> that, is, that was dust. That was dust. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That was dust from our vacuum cleaner. That was nice. So there's, there's well, what's dust? What's dust made of? Household dust. What's it? Dirt. 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 Yeah. Hair. Lots of hair. A little bit of dog hair. Big Alan's hair. Sorry. Yeah. So yeah, there's some. Uh, dirt from the outside, they give you bugs and lights and other things. So, how much is dust worth? Zero. 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 Can you sell dust? No. no. Nobody would buy dust? No. Really? Okay, so if that's the case, scale of 1 to 10, 1 being uh, totally worthless, 10 being absolutely essential, how important is dust? Zero. 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 Off the charts. Okay. The Bible would beg to differ. Over a hundred times, dust shows up in the Bible. Now, why on earth would something as gross and loud, pointless as dust show up in the Bible that many times? Most of the time, dust shows up. It shows up underneath and on people. Most of the time, people are sitting in dust, and they put dust on their heads. Now, why do people put dust on their heads? If dust is gross, if it's kind of dirty, if it's just pointless and worthless and invaluable, why do people put dust on their heads and all over their bodies? To make them feel the same way that dust is. Because we all tend to make a mess of all kinds of things. So, just want you to think for a second about the last few days, week, two weeks, just your recent past. Uh, don't say anything out loud, just think about a mess that you have made. And I'm not talking about milk you spilled on the counter or a jar you broke on the floor. I'm, I'm talking about a relationship mess, or a, I spoke these words and it caused a problem mess, or I didn't mean to do that, but I did that, and oh, what a mess that made that person. We all create all kinds of messes. Just picture a mess that you were part of in the last couple weeks. I have this feeling we can all think of one, at least, maybe more. I can certainly think of some. We all make messes. 
Now, I asked this question to a group of middle school students this week. I also gave them a bag of dust to raise their hand into this week. When I asked them, uh, how did they feel when they thought about those messes that they made? Here are some of the words that they used to describe how they felt with the messes that they made. You agree? Yeah. Pretty good? Yeah. Yeah, I was impressed. I thought, I thought the words that they came up with were, were very insightful. We don't feel good when we make a mess, but we all make a mess. And in the Bible, when people would cover themselves with dust, it was to say, I made a mess, and it's a problem. And I need to feel the full weight of my mess. Because if I don't, I'm going to forget the mess that I made. And then I'm not going to be able to work through it. Dust helps us feel the messes that we made. I need another volunteer. <laughs> I know. You see, the, the middle school yeah. students had no problem with this. But I thought, surely, surely my church will do well. Um, anybody else? Thank you, John. Come on up. Okay. okay. So, same thing. Close your eyes. Reach in. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, ready, set, go. Reach in. Don't pull it out. Just keep it in there. Um, what does it feel like? Well, it feels uh, soft, but a little bit of gravel. Yeah. Uh, soft and gravel? Yeah. It uh, feels, doesn't feel like what my aunt felt. I don't think there's any bugs in here. No, 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 no. There's some, yeah, there's some harder things in here. I mean, okay. a lot of them, but there's some harder things. So if you had to guess what it is, what would you guess that it might be? Uh, uh, spaghetti. No, I don't know. Alright, you can open your eyes. Yeah? Kind of looks like flour, but yeah, it's ash. That is ash. So, here, help you out. Sorry. One more, one more. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's that's ash. That's ash, actually ash from palm branches. Uh, it turns white. Uh, it marks black, but turns white. Kind of odd and strange. Um, where do we get ash? Sometimes palm branches, but it's the result of what? Fire. fire. Yeah, fire. When when some when a fire ravages a, a city, turns everything to ash. Uh, fire in a fireplace turns things to ash. It is the result of destruction. How important is ash? Yeah. One? Ten? Yeah. So ash is quite important. And in, in fact, in the Bible, it shows up many, many times similar to dust. People would often sit in ashes and cover themselves with ashes. Now, why on earth would they cover themselves in ashes? Because they wanted to feel like the ashes were. They're the result of destruction, and how often do we destroy things, and sometimes we just need to feel the full destruction of the things that we do. We destroy promises, we destroy trust, we destroy relationships, we destroy agreements, we destroy all kinds of things. Ash helps feel the full weight of those things. There are a couple of places in the Bible where these two are put together, where ash and dust are both put together. One of them is in the book of Job, and it goes like this. I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. How, how does he feel about himself? Not good. I despise myself, and I repent. I turn in dust and ashes. It's at a point where he was feeling horrible about some things that he had said and done, and he needed to feel the full weight of what he had said and done. So he sat in dust and ashes. There are other places that this shows up, where people sit in dust and cover themselves with dust and ashes. In Ezekiel, in Genesis, and further other places in Job, time again people are doing this. 
So often when a mess happens, when we create a mess and we're deep into a mess and we're in deep trouble because of the mess, we often think, it'll get better. You know, with time, it'll work itself out. Or things will be, things will be okay, I'll just, I'll just wait a bit. Uh, I can figure this out, it's gonna be okay. Or uh, somebody told me it's gonna be fine, so it'll work out. I hope all of our messes work out, but a lot of them don't work out that easily. Paul, in one of his most famous letters, wrote to a church about some of the messes that they were in. In fact, some of the big messes that they were in. He wrote to a church in the city of Ephesus, and he wrote to them people that he knew well. I mean, this is like, he's not writing to people who he never met or he didn't know. He's writing to people whose faith he knew, whose faith he worked with. He did Bible studies with them. He preached sermons to them. He did church with them for actually years. And he's writing to them to say, here's the reality, here's what's happening, and here's what can help. He's talking to them about the messes that they made and what to do about it. So here is a part of Ephesians chapter 2 where Paul starts to talk about this to this church. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of all the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. How deep of trouble were these folks in? Pretty deep? Yeah. How does Paul describe their situation, their place? They were dead. They were dead. Dead. At the same time, he says they were alive to certain things. It's not just they're dead, they're alive. What are they alive to? They're alive to sin, they're alive to passion and inclinations and all kinds of things. They were alive to things. But Paul says if you're not alive to the right things, consider yourselves just dead. They were dead to what God wanted for their lives. Were they all by themselves in this situation? What would you say? Were they all alone? No. They were just like everyone else. They were not by themselves. They were in great company. Because everybody was in the same situation. They were doing the same things as everybody else. They were just like everybody else. They were no different than everybody else. They were just the same. Throughout the Bible, there's this fascinating thing that God often does. Back from the beginning, God called Abraham and Sarah and Jacob and Joseph and all these members of this whole family, God called them to follow God and be part of God's family. God called Moses to come and rescue God's people and God called him to rescue them, to bring them into the promised land so they could be called God's chosen people. Time and again, God does this thing where God reaches out to people, he calls them, and he makes, he wants them to come and be this. He pulls them out of this and into this. He brings them from this place in their lives to be these kinds of people. He's taking them from being like the rest of everybody else and he's saying, I want you to be my people. I want you to be my followers. I want you to be my children. And it's like God is saying, I don't want you to be like everybody else because that's not what I created everybody for. I created you to be mine, to follow me, to live like me, follow me. I want you to be different than everybody else. And that's what Paul is describing. Don't just be like everybody else in that sort of way. You used to be like that. That's not what God made us to be. So Paul's basically saying that being in a relationship with God means that we can't just be the same as everyone else. But oftentimes we must be different, just the opposite of everybody else. 
So how does that happen? I'll give you two hints. It's not about me and you, and it doesn't take just working harder and faster. Paul continues in his uh, statement to the Ephesians about what it takes and how this can happen to not just be like everybody else, but to be oftentimes the opposite. He says, but God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you've been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms, because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible love of his grace and kindness for us, as shown in all he does, has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us in you in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Let's compare a couple things. How many things in Paul's whole statement do we do? We believe. That's it. One thing only. How many things does God do? Quite a few. I mean, a lot of things. He does the he does the heavy lifting. God definitely does a whole lot more. Let's compare who can take credit for all this. What can we take credit for? Yeah, nothing. Nothing there. Uh, what can God take credit for? Yeah, all of it. Yeah, God. Does, God does it all. God makes it happen. When we find ourselves creating a mess, when we find ourselves deep, deep in trouble, when we find ourselves with no way out, God is the one who dives deep into our lives, into our hearts, to be able to make things new for us. Ever since the year 601, people have been observing the season of Lent, just like we observe it today. 46 days, 40 days when we remember how dead we are to the things of God, and six days to celebrate what God has done in making us alive. Forty-six days of Lent. That's a lot of days. It's a lot of days to remember, it's a lot of days to observe, it's a lot of days to thank God, it's a lot of days to think about ourselves. For a long time, this whole season of Lent, we did fasting. Uh, fasting from different things, fasting from food or fasting from other things, but then on the Sundays, people would break the fast, as if to say, I'm not dead anymore, but God has made me alive, so I'm going to periodically feast and celebrate and feel the full weight of God saving me and God doing great things in my life. The season of Lent is, is a long time. It's, it's long enough for us to be able to create new habits, to be able to let things sink in to our minds, uh, to even change some things about who we are and what we do. As we do every year, we often try to make this season special in some different ways by doing different things. And there's a few things that I just want to highlight that we're going to do. First thing is ashes. Today is Ash Sunday. Ashes are reminders we have just learned that we destroy things, but we're not left in our destruction. God is the one who saves us from that destruction. So in a few minutes, we're going to have a chance to be able to be marked with a cross on the forehead uh, with ashes. It's a reminder of the messes that we often make, but the fact that those ashes will disappear soon reminds us that God does save us. God creates a new life for us. Uh, we are also making, uh, if you would like to, making, uh, designing these bags. They're in the next room, and there's some supplies to be able to stamp them, or write on them, draw on them, other things you want to do to make it kind of your own. These are little bags that we encourage you to carry around with you for the next 43 days until the end of Lent, the day before Easter, or the day. <laughs> Carry it around in your pocket, in your purse, 
uh, around your neck, in your shoe, somewhere else, carry it around all the time. And every day add one more penny to the bag. It's a way of feeling the mounting weight of our sin in our lives. Add a penny, and by the end, we'll have approximately 40 pennies. There are some instruction cards also in there. On Good Friday, we're going to bring these bags, if you're available to come to our Good Friday service, we're going to bring these bags and we're going to do some things, including empty these bags, to remind us that God is the one who forgives our sin. If you're not available, it's totally fine, but there's some instruction cards in there on some ways to empty this on Good Friday and remind you of how to do that. So I encourage you, before you leave, grab a bag, decorate your bag so that it makes your own, and then fill it with a penny a day. We're also collecting socks uh, for three different organizations, as Desiree mentioned, uh, for my study emergency aid to give out to kids especially, uh, to love aid to give to especially homeless that they give some packages to, and also Redwood School just opened a thrift store for students at the school who are in need. Um, and so they need socks. So we're going to donate some of our socks to them as well. Uh, just another way to be able to participate in the community, especially with students who are in need. So as we uh, bring socks, and you're welcome to bring any kinds of socks for especially children and students, we're going to add to our wall of socks and we'll be able to hopefully help and bless a number of students around the area. So. Would you pray with me?